<clears throat> All right, well, uh, we're going to finish. Uh, we had a couple more topics related to Catholic morality from last week that I want to finish. But then uh, the next topic on the schedule is virtue and vice. So that's what I'm going to talk about mostly tonight. Um, so, but those last few things, I want to say we left off talking about the dignity of like the human person. And I think we were talking about abortion somewhat. Um, so I'll pick up what I had after that. Um, the next thing <clears throat> I want to talk about was our understanding of goodness. So obviously morality, right, is about searching for the good. But that term can kind of be sort of slippery. Do you think we could try to nail down what do we mean when we say do the good or search for the good or be good? Because we, we use it in a million different contexts. Um, that's a good soda, right? Or I have a good friend or God is good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I know there's like universal truths that like God is there to rule all, all of our hearts. Okay. It's like doing whatever God is not to do and doing whatever they do in heart. Okay. What's written on your heart by God? All right. Yeah. Something that brings joy. Okay, something that brings joy. Now, are you distinguishing joy and maybe like uh, more instant gratification or? Okay, yeah, the last thing. Anybody else? Well, it is a tricky word, um, but our tradition has a very beautiful explanation for it. So, in its most basic sense, when we say something is good, we mean that it, it benefits uh, us in some way. Now, we, our nature, which we talked about, right, is sort of multifaceted. Last week we were talking about the soul, right, having an intellect and a will. But then also we have the, the body, right, and we have these certain like physical drives and appetites and desires. Then there's also these like social um, desires that we have, for example, like to um, take pride in our work or to be honored or things like that. And so uh, these different aspects of our nature um, have a corresponding good which they're seeking. Okay, so for example, just the most basic thing, right? I have a, we all have a stomach, right? What is that capacity for food? What is What desire does that bring with it? Hunger, right? And so you feel that appetite for hunger Right, so then you perceive goodness in the food, right? That's gonna sustain you or nourish you or it taste good, right? And so therefore you seek it out. Um, so we can start with like the most basic, I guess, which we would call like, uh, or Aquinas would call the vegetative soul, meaning like those like biological drives that we all have, right? For water, for food, for sleep, uh, for rest. All those things are good, okay, but there's also other things like, like we said with our soul, right, a deep desire to love and to be loved, to know God and to be known by God, all right? How do we decipher how to arrange these different goods from all the way from sleep to adoration and prayer? Are they, you think they're all in the same plane, or? Might not be phrasing that very well. Um, I guess maybe we could think about it as like a hierarchy. Sort of like, uh, are you familiar with the, what is that pyramid of needs called? Um, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, it starts at the bottom with the most bodily needs, and the top is like your most social like uh, fulfillment. Um, <clears throat> in a certain way, uh, when the church talks about the good in the human person, it is kind of like that, right? Not all goods are equal. Um, 
And so you have some at the very bottom, like pleasurable things that are enjoyable, right? But they're very like bodily, right? And as you go up the hierarchy, we find things more valuable than that. Let's say um, being popular, right? Or, or being honored for, for doing something, all right? There are things higher than that, say maybe like friendship, all right? And then at the very top of the hierarchy, um, like we mentioned, that is like our deepest self where we desire ultimately the intimacy with God, okay? And, um, and so most of the time, this might be helpful when we, when we mess up or when we sin, it's because we have this hierarchy out of whack, right? Where we've put something that's not God at the very top uh, in God's place. And so our priorities are mixed up. Now, that's not to say that um, we're Puritans, right? Where we're, you can't enjoy food or, or alcohol or, you know, being together with friends or all those things about life. But what it's saying is that everything has its proper order in place. And so you have to, to experience the goodness that God intended in things. You have to order those things in your life in, uh, I guess, say their proper place on that hierarchy. Is that making a little bit of sense? Okay. Um, Aquinas has an interesting term uh, for this, what he calls apparent goods. Um, authentic goods versus apparent goods. So apparent goods would be goods that seem, I guess, maybe like seductive or desirable to us. But, as you can kind of guess, they end up not having that lasting value or lasting meaning. Maybe we would call it today instant gratification, like instant gratification type goods today. Things, okay, you're, you're doom scrolling on your phone, all right, on some social media app. It feels good, that's why you do it, but it doesn't really have any lasting value for your life when you... When you finally put the phone down, actually, you might honestly feel worse than when you picked it up. Right? It's this very fleeting, um, instant type of gratification. Um, as opposed to, like he mentioned, uh, other goods which um, may not feel as good in the moment, but have a lasting power or lasting effect to them. Yeah. So I, like, I was like, yeah. Is there a difference between doing it to like calm yourself down and feel good for that moment, like as in like you need a break, versus like picking it up to like just that instant gratification? Um, okay, so like I mentioned, it's not necessarily bad. <clears throat> there can be a time and place for instant gratification, but it can become bad when it is when it kind of takes over to a place more than it's supposed to be. Like, yeah, let's say you've worked hard all day, right? You have whatever, 30 minutes before you have to go to bed, and you just want to get on there and just kind of mindlessly do. That might be perfectly healthy or fine, right? Um, but let's say you stay up to 4 a.m., you know, going on there, right? Then that good has kind of gotten out of where it should be and taken over a higher place than it should. That makes sense. Kind of sounds like you're with addiction almost. Or? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's the problem with addiction, right? What happens with addicts is they're so hooked on whatever that drug is, right, that they're willing to sacrifice everything else in that hierarchy for that one thing. So they'll sacrifice friendships, family, trust, job, home, health, right? for that whatever high or whatever they get from it. So that's that's why addiction's so bad, right? Because because the instant gratification takes over. Yeah. There is um, temporary goods in trying to take the place of apparent goods and fail at it. The apparent goods, uh, vice versa, the apparent goods are actually take um, actually replace instant gratification or is it is it should you have a good balance of both? Oh, okay. So um, I probably wasn't clear in the terminology. 
So apparent goods and instant gratification are really the same thing. Like apparent meaning like it, it presents itself as good, but may not really be. I guess the other word would be yeah, like authentic. authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so were you asking, are they both okay? Or um, I was asking, so apparent goods can't take the place of authentic goods. Okay. Could authentic goods take the place of apparent goods? Or should it just be balanced out? Like, is that better if the authentic good was necessarily take better than take more priority? Yeah, the, yeah. That's a good question. And that fits perfectly with what we're going to talk about virtue and vice. But I'm kind of curious to throw that out to everybody else. So if I understand what he's asking, what should that balance be, right? You can really focus on delayed gratification goals. Okay, what are, like, I don't know, you want to be, I don't know, uh, enough about the military to say, but like something that's like a really high position that you would have to work for and sacrifice for for a long time. Okay, how much should you focus on those things versus like giving up whatever the instant gratification things like your sleep, maybe um, time with friends, maybe TV, internet, whatever. What do y'all, I'm curious what y'all think that balance should look like. <clears throat> Yeah. Like so much of the fun we're about like having to like start on yourself by like giving up on one health. Okay. So as long as you're like taking care of you know, maybe eating healthy and sleeping. Okay, yeah. Uh maybe like having your own focus and set up goals for yourself. Um okay. using the instant gratification stuff to like pay your bills. After you reach those certain milestones. Okay. That's interesting. All right, who else? Yeah. I was just going along with you, Fred, uh, like not, so there's a huge psychological impact of not having the friends, not having the sleep, and like when that starts hitting, yeah. that's when it becomes a problem. Those are no longer like apparent, but it's really like authentic. Or... Okay, all right. So that would definitely, yeah, be kind of like out of, out of whack. Um, I do know, unfortunately, certain parts of the military, I think more like your um, spe uh, special operations, but probably other units too, require so much um, time and dedication. I think they have like an 80 or 90% divorce rate for people who are part of that, um, just because you're gone for probably like 300 days of the year. So yeah, it's, that's a tough, how do you balance? That's a really interesting question. Um, so uh, I guess maybe the philosophical answer I would give is it's okay to like seek the good for every part of you, right? But as long as it keeps its proper place. So I, I wouldn't say sleeping is a bad thing or, or going out with friends is a bad thing. I think you need to do all those things in a healthy way. Um, but also having goals isn't bad either. And sometimes maybe giving up some of those things for your goals, I think is also good. Um, so maybe there's a little bit of like gray area in there where you have to decide at this point in your life, what's important to you. Um, but certainly once you make a commitment, let's say you get married, right? You, I feel like that commitment kind of trumps most everything else. Um, but a lot of people I know are pulled because they want to be really successful at their job, but at the cost of their marriage or the cost of not being there for their kids. And as a Catholic, I think we're supposed to consider um, marriage or priesthood as like a primary vocation and our job as a secondary vocation. So secular people might have a different view of this, but I think for us, you have to kind of prioritize and make sure at least you were there decent amount for, for your family, because that's your primary calling, I guess. Um, any questions? Yeah. Well, also that choosing a vocation, like for example, marriage, <coughs> the priesthood for, for men, that means that you may choose, that means that you may be giving up something for the sake of that vocation. And, and, and you have to be okay with that. 
say, or, or you have yeah. to be matched with, say, the priest is a free with the chance or the opportunity to be married and to have that kind of closeness with another human being. He sacrifices that for something that he, that is greater. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. And so, how do you deal with that, right? And I think if you really want to live out your vocation where you make these sacrifices, you honestly have to be rooted in prayer and intimacy with God. The best priests that I know do like a holy hour every day to start their day. And I think a lot of the priests that you see that kind of end up getting into bad stuff or scandals, a lot of times if you dig deeper, you realize they haven't, they had they don't pray. And so they've lost that connection with God. And so then some of the sacrifices they take on become too burdensome. And, you know, whatever happens. So, yeah, there's a lot to think about there. There's a lot to think about. Um, back to uh, actual goods. So if you had to characterize, you were trying to distinguish what's an apparent good and what's an actual good. Um, an actual good is something that is iterable, meaning you can um, continue to do this action over long periods of time and it will still be beneficial for you. In fact, it'll be beneficial for you and for the people around you. Um, whereas apparent goods, they're not iterable. So you can't sustain them for very long without some serious negative effect to you or to other people. So just to take a silly example, um, okay, candy, right? It's not in and of itself bad to have a candy bar. But if I substitute that for my dinner every day, how long can I sustain that, right, before who knows what happens to my health, right? That wouldn't be sustainable, right? So that would be something that it has a place, but in a certain sense, it could be an apparent good if I tried to have too much of it. Whereas whatever a steak and and you know some broccoli or whatever right you could have that every day, um, if you see what I mean. Uh, but these things also apply you know to more serious stuff too. Um, I don't know if anybody listens to Jordan Peterson, but he has a, some really good explanations on this in terms of short term. I guess dating, or he might call it mating strategies, where where people have these very short, whatever, hookups or relationships, and whatever, our secular world doesn't really consider or think much about that. But as a psychologist, it's really interesting how he brings out sort of the effects of that. Somebody who tries to live over a long period of time with those very fleeting relationships and hookups. Um, and, and I think he makes the case well that that's, that's not a long-term strategy that you can sustain. Um, so that kind of way of looking at things, you can really apply it to a whole number of different topics. All right. I feel like there's so much there that we could get into, but anything else on goodness, uh, apparent goods, authentic goods? This hierarchy of goods that y'all want to talk about. I don't feel like I did a good enough job because I think your point was really well said. That as a Christian, there sometimes are things that you just have to give up for the sake of something higher. Um, So if anybody has more thoughts on that, raise your hand at some point and, and expound on it. But I think there's a lot there. Yeah. What about like the case of the recent story? I mean, like, for example, uh, taking a case of that relationship that devotion to God is just everlasting, uh, while that's something that's like getting a higher, um, getting a higher wage for my job. Okay. Yeah, well, I think the, the truest authentic good, obviously, is going to be that which sustains us forever, 
right? And that, that can only be one thing, right? And that's probably why we're all here, is because we realize I'm going to die, whether that's tomorrow or whether that's whatever, 50 years, I'm not going to live forever. And so even if I get the higher wage, if I get the mansion, if I get a family, right? Yes, those things last longer, but it's all temporary. And so thus we're led to that next step of what is permanent in this life? Um, and Pope Benedict has a beautiful quote on that um, where he reflects even, even the most beautiful relationships we have with our loved ones, even those things have a fragility to them, right? Because we're going to lose them at some point or we're going to die first or whatever. And so really the only true authentic good is that which lasts forever, which, which has to be our relationship with God. Um, and I guess what the saints talk about is when you die, the only thing you're going to take with you to God are your acts of love that you've done in your life. So those moments where you truly loved another person, you did something for their good, you sacrificed yourself for another, those things are going to be with you forever. But maybe all your success, fame, wealth, you're going to leave all those things behind. It's going to get burned away, so to speak. And it's just you, God, and the good that you've done in a certain sense. Yeah. And all other goods that are secondary to that, are, I think, are things that even, even those could be not good. Um, for example, uh, eating is is good for you, and eating, you know, nutritious food is good for you, but if you ate too much of anything, it can make you sick, mm -hmm. right? If you, so it, it's, well, it, it falls into the vices, right? To be overly indulgent or, you know, um, to be gluttonous. Um, but if any, any good thing can be bad if it's taken to an extreme, except for God, <laughs> right? <laughs> Even even sometimes though I've seen you can be overly scrupulous, right? Be overly scrupulous. Right. Or um I when I was younger there was this lady who was always at church. And then I found out like she was married and but I never saw any of her family with her and I always wondered like it's awesome that you're like always here praying, but like where's your where's your husband? <laughs> yeah. Um so that, yeah, that's a great point. You have to figure out that golden mean as far as how to balance everything. But, but yeah, ultimately, loving God, you can't go wrong with if you're doing it in the right way. Okay, um, then again, there are some things which there is no amount of them that can be good. Does anybody know we have like a specific phrase that in theology, we call these things. Doesn't matter the circumstance, doesn't matter who's involved, um, they just can never be good. Okay, was that, yeah, yeah, Satan, <laughs> true. Mortal sins. Mortal sins, all right, true. Okay, yeah, well, maybe we could say sins in general, yeah. Um, there's a specific term, though, called intrinsically evil actions so like intrinsic meaning like within the thing so the very nature of the action is so corrupt that no intention behind it no circumstance surrounding it right can justify committing that action hmm? okay maybe that, that's a good one i think i can't Think of the circumstance off the top of my head where blasphemy would be. Uh, yeah. What if uh, you, were, you were told if you if you're not changing religion right now, you die. If you change your religion, but you still believe God, practice the same same teachings and all that. You still in that moment you technically chose a way out rather than keep your faith in God. Ooh. Unless like give the direction by in itself, you know, that's kind of that's kind of what you're saying, basically. 
Yeah, and that was a big controversy in the early church. Um, in uh, after the persecution started between Nero and Constantine, there were many Christians who, under pain of death, renounced their faith or threw incense to pagan gods. Um, obviously, that's a tough situation. And that really pushed the church to have to figure out how to reconcile those people, though. And a lot of them had to do penance for a really long time. Yeah. I mean, it's a different circumstance considering it's Old Testament. There are many like examples of things like worshiping a different god or worshiping an idol, where you still, like, they weren't like completely cut out of the faith until they had done it so many times. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. even then, they were still given an opportunity. He never like let them go or something like that. Yeah, sure. Um, and the it really pushed the church to develop the sacrament of confession more. Um, so yeah, there there's always a route back, but I wouldn't say that that would be a justified thing at the same yeah. time. Um, there's a beautiful movie I was mentioning uh, heard the other week called A Hidden Life. Y'all probably don't have much free time at all but if you do you can search up that movie um it's a beautiful story about an austrian farmer in the 1930s who called up to fight for hitler and he knew what was going on and he didn't feel that it was justified even though everybody in his village was pressuring him and uh so he refused to fight and knowing that that's gonna, basically was going to cost him his life um and, they, and even at one point, they gave him a way out saying, like, all right, you don't want to fight? Go work in a hospital. And he's like, okay. But they said, you still have to take an uh, oath of loyalty to Hitler. And he wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do it. So he ended up being uh, guillotined. But, but yeah, there's, there's times in history, I pray that, I'm not faced with that time, but there have been plenty of Christians who are faced with that. Uh, yeah, let's go back, though. What else? We got blasphemy. All right, what are some other things you think would fall into this category of intrinsically evil act? Well, sometimes it's like the What's that? Lust. Lust. Okay, yeah, lust. Uh, um, rape is definitely on there. I think we could put lust on there. What about, and this might interest y'all, killing? Is killing on there? Depends. It depends on the circumstance. Okay, all right. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> all right, let's go to the middle here. Like, if someone like, breaks into my house, I'm going to kill your family. There's no question. I'm going to protect my family first. Yeah. Um, but it's not that, like, one life is like, oh. It's not that like life loses value and like they like break your family, but it's it, it, it's still taking a life, but it's like for my family and I'm like, yeah. I'm, just, I'm not gonna let you take it away from me. Good, 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 yeah. What do you I mean there are also again referring back to the old testament instances where God says, Kill these people off, kill all of them. Mm -hmm. If it if it, yeah. if it is a, <laughs> a godly thing, he is telling you to do it, it can't be wrong. Okay, fair, yeah. Um, let's go over here. Um, I mean, I'm not like 100 percent sure that this is true, but it's like to my understanding that the church has pardoned soldiers during times of war for killing, um, like so that it's not considered murder. Good. Okay, so is there a distinction here that we need to um, find out between killing and murder? I feel like y'all are right on it. Yeah. Right. It's not really not on that distinction, but like sort of in the case where like. I guess, like in self defense, where like they say, like, you know, stop like doing that. You, you, everyone here, we get in the channel for like choosing like mercy at the very end, which is a better thing to do than outright killing them. Right? Where, so, like, okay. If you're successful in defending yourself and, you know, they like swear to like try to get back, yeah. like, then the promise of like killing them just because they started a fight wouldn't be right and God showed them mercy. So, like, if killing them is the only way to stop them, then that would be just. Yeah, that's fair. Necessary. It's Try to de -es de escalate and don't kill unless you have to. Okay. Yeah, I feel like. Uh, I, I think it was right. Like, I read somewhere about in the uh, Old 
the modern dissertation combined with Dao Shan Lao Shui, there is kind of a misinterpretation. It's Dao Shan Lao Shui Lao. Good. And it's merged around Lao Shui, and you know, you should be going to self defense through self preservation. Critical those are the preservation measures. Hmm. All right, done out of malice. Is there any other distinction that might go with murder rather than killing? Yeah. I mean, overall, like it, it is all about the intention. So, like the intention of ridding the earth of that specific person, okay. like because of something you like, you like some earthly thing, for example, not necessarily some godly thing. What well, would be an example of what you're? So, for example, if you, like, let's say you were really, really big about saving the environment, and there was okay. this one guy who was, like, the head of an oil corporation, and they had, like, an oil spill in the Gulf Coast. And you were like, okay, well, I'm going to save this planet. Um, yeah. He needs to go. <laughs> that's that's okay. some, like... While it may have like good intentions here, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be a good thing if you're still murdering the guy. Okay, okay, yeah, oh, that's a great example. All right, um, so traditionally, the distinction between killing and murder has to do with the person being killed either being an aggressor or being innocent. Okay, so we call something murder when the person killed is an innocent person that hasn't done something that deserves death. All right, but like your example, somebody breaking into your home and well, I mean, attacking your family, right? They would be an aggressor. I, I mean, like, if someone, like, does something horrible and then they, like, surrender, like, they've given themselves up to be judged by God in the end. So it's not really like they still, like, taking their lives. Like, if somebody, like, like, just for, for an example, like, let's say, like, somebody, like, Break away somebody and then they turn themselves in. Or uh, you, you know that they did, but it had nothing to do with it. Okay. Like it's, the police. Like it's, it's not any person's place to go and kill them because, in the end, that's God's decision to decide where they should end up. Okay, that's a good distinction between maybe in the moment of them being aggressor versus maybe, like, like he said, things some things happen where it's settled down. And then the person is is not an aggressor at that moment. But I would say the government, and this is traditionally the role of the death penalty, might step in and say that it's necessary to kill that person. And that's the judicial system working its way out, and like you said, you met your own like you're just good. Given capital justice to some person. Yeah, good to, yeah. I probably could think of many aggressors being people maybe with mental illnesses or drug addictions. So that's a good, you want, yeah. Well, okay, so I, I was thinking through this as, uh, I started thinking about double effect, but I also started thinking about if you're trying to stop an aggressor, then the goal of stopping the aggressor, the goal is really to, to protect who the aggressor is coming for, yeah. right? So you're trying to protect your family, and you do you use whatever is the uh, appropriate means to, to protect the family. If the person is far enough away that you 
and, and they don't have the deadly weapon in their hands, but they're coming at you with a knife and they're far enough away, and you can shoot them in the legs versus in the head, then maybe you stop them without killing them. I mean, that's kind of a, I don't know, like, you, you don't want to go beyond what you need to do in order to protect who you're protecting. But you also need to make sure that you do a sufficient job of protecting the person, which might mean that that person will die because you're protecting their family. Yeah. It's so it's the double effect thing is, you know, you're you're protecting the family and the, the fallout of that, you're not intending to kill somebody, but in the course of protecting the family, someone may die. <laughs> I yeah, and then there may be two different things to, to discuss. One is judgment. One's judgment. And really, when you can mix the two together and say, you let the government do judgment, that's not their job. So their judgment is not their job. What their job is, to protect the interest. Okay, so they, he swoops it around where it's where, where letting them say, this person should be um, killed, or this person should be in prison for um, the rest of their lives, or whatever. But, but that's different from judgment. So when you're looking at yourself, that's where the judgment is. When you judge yourself, you can't judge it, and say someone has insane, they don't have free will. They don't, they don't have the ability to determine what's right or wrong. You know what I mean? If they're, if they're insane. So, what she says is perfect. You don't need, you know, the eye for an eye or two for two wasn't that if you take out my eye, I have to take out your eye. It wasn't that. It was that the punishment is never to be worse than the crime. If I kill a loaf of bread, don't cut off the law. Does that make sense? It's a limit not to do that. The only judgment you have is God Himself. He can see into your heart. That's what conscience is. The final judgment is like this one on the cross. You're there, God's there, and you're discussing what you're going to do in conscience. That's, that's really what Judgment Day is. We already know. We've seen one Judgment Day in, you know, up front. So that, that's why it, that, that is a struggle when someone comes in there and says, This isn't fair. This guy killed somebody, and we need to kill him. You know, and, but I do think know that he's guilty. There is an important distinction between um, like I said, judging someone's soul versus judging someone's action. Because mm -hmm. someone's actions are more objective. You can objectively see that man lunging towards you with the knife or something. Whereas judging someone's soul, like you pointed out, only God can know that um, because we can't get inside somebody's mind. And sometimes people don't even know why they do why they do things. So uh, just to go back to your example, um, you know, if someone's insane or drunk, I think you still, if they're an objective threat, you still have to objectively stand in and protect your family. Um, again, you're not making a moral judgment on them, but you, you have to act, right? Um, and then to uh, bring back another point, when you do that, the action is defined as defending the innocent, right? What, what type of person would you be if you let them hurt, let's say, your child? Right? That would be almost even worse. So um, it just goes back to this, this tricky thing we talked about with uh, frozen embryos a few weeks ago. Sometimes because of the sinful nature of this world, people put themselves or others between a rock and a hard place where there's no perfect moral situation out. Um, but that's not, all you can do, right, is to try to protect the innocent and, the, and they have to suffer the, the consequences as, as the aggressor. Now, that doesn't mean we can go overboard, it has to be proportionate, right, because um, you can obviously go overboard with violence, and this really jumps into a whole uh, theory of just war. Um, so war is allowed in the Catholic Church, but there are certain criteria that have to be met for it to be considered a, a just war. Um, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I think we have time enough to go into this. Um, so yeah, let's, there's, a, I believe, four or five criteria. Um, let's see if I can recall them off the top of my head here. Uh, so one of them has to be 
Um, there is an immediate and serious threat. Um, so this kind of brings up the idea of like a preeminent strikes um, and the morality of that, but I'll just put that on hold for a second. So serious and immediate threat, um, all other forms of resolving the conflict have been exhausted. So you've tried diplomacy, maybe you've tried economic sanctions, maybe you've tried whatever, getting together with other countries um, to, to talk to them. Okay, and this is a last resort. Um, there has to be a serious chance of success, okay, meaning that uh, you're not just killing for the sake of killing. Um, like, I know we, there's no chance, but we're just going to go and kill who we can just out of hatred or whatever. And then the last one, um, you have to use proportional force, meaning, okay, you can't go way overboard. Um, it has, you have to meet the threat with an equal response. Yeah. All right. So most countries don't go to war because of, um, like, it's a last result. Most people go to war because of action in war. But if something like that, like, I hate to bring it up, but something yeah. like 9-11, yeah. it's not, war was not necessarily the last resort there. It was an mm -hmm. action of war for something big, but there probably, it probably wasn't like, we need to go to war. Okay, okay. Um, what do they call a legitimate country? It has to be a country. What they did wasn't a country. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, well, I maybe it's more on Iraq, that. but I feel like the perception of what we did in Iraq is changing, and there's been a lot more questioning of, like, eh, why were we really there? Um, but that's hard, right? Because who are the people making those big decisions about sending everybody underneath them off to fight, you know? Yeah, the, the yeah. two Dutch World Wars of Adam Bomb, and then back, they kind of just went back and forth on that. You know, they, it's tough. Because they have dropped an Adam Bomb. And I, I think um, the Catechism, if you follow what's in the Catechism, would say no. Because there's a prohibition against indiscriminate killing, like not distinguishing between civilian targets and military targets, which a bomb like that wouldn't. Now, some people make the case, um, historically, that the Japanese had taken this like civilian code of like to fight to the death, and so everybody could have been considered combatant, but I, I don't think a little child is taking that code. Yeah. Also, like, I think they said that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were both considered like a military verdict because of like they had like naval force and like shipyards and like everything like spread out through the town because like they knew that they wanted like just for the sake of charging by smaller bombs. Ooh, that's also a good question. What's the acceptable radius for possibly hurting an innocent? I don't have an exact answer for you on that. That's that's hard. Yeah, that's kind of hard too. Part of that is like the U.S. was firebombing Japan like yeah. the entire time they. Uh, the atomic bombs. So that's kind of like a, a tricky place to start getting to. But. And I would be willing to bet almost any time we've been part of a conflict, innocent people have died. Right. Well, like right. the fire bombs, like the first bombs started out as it trying to hit military targets, but at the same time, like it was so inaccurate, there was 80 zillion yeah. friends and everything. So then they just decided, like, well, we're just going to bomb them anyway. So like, civilians didn't really come to attack it like they bombed. That's a good point. Yeah. So, um, would you say, like, uh, as far as what I was thinking in how it's all for example, like, if something that was bad that may have killed an innocent people, but could have saved the lives of, let's say, like, the atomic bomb that the United States had made, by not being the last bomb, that you should have, right? Would, it, would that be, would that make it somewhat, somewhat inherently? So, I will get, yeah, this is a very complex historical question, and I'm not going to say I have the exact right answer, 
But all I can say is if you follow Catholic principles, you can't really make a utilitarian calculation of something in the future. You're, you have to consider um, the dignity of every person right now. Um, and so I don't think morally we could justify kind of like a, a pragmatic or utilitarian view of, of these things. The, the, the church's principles, it's like pretty hard and fast, and then we're supposed to try our best to apply those principles. And yeah, utilitarianism, or I guess- uh, Is it fair to say that the, that's a, is it fair to say that end never justifies means? That's a good point. Yeah, and that was on my list of uh, things to talk about. Um, well, I'm not answering that. I'm asking. Oh, yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's deeply true. Catholic principle. The ends don't yeah, justify the means. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if you have a good outcome, it doesn't justify doing something evil in the process of achieving that outcome. Um, so we're supposed to try to do good all the way through. Now, there may obviously be, like she mentioned, principle of devil effect. Us trying to do the good in a fallen world may result in an evil, but that evil was not directly willed by us. It was only indirectly happened because, like I said, of, of people's sin in, in, in the world, if that makes sense. Um, okay, I forgot how I got on that tangent there. Oh yeah, just war. Okay, oh yeah, killing, killing and murder. Yeah. <laughs> um, so murder would be on the intrinsically evil act. We can never directly kill the innocent. Okay. But that, but killing, let's say in self-defense or in a just war, is not intrinsically evil. There are times where you have to do that to protect the innocent. Um, now, sometimes people will bring up the case. Okay, what if you have um, a pregnant woman? who, um, let's say, also is diagnosed with cancer. What do you do in that situation? Okay, well, you cannot perform an abortion as such, as we know it, right? Because an abortion as such is to go in and directly dismember that human being and directly end their life. Okay, that would be directly killing the innocent. What you can do is try to offer treatments to the woman, uh, let's say chemotherapy, to try to attack the cancer, and it may indirectly harm that child. Um, but again, you're not directly trying to kill them. Um, you're trying to save both of them. Um, but like we mentioned, it may have a secondary effect of harming the child. I don't know, does that... Y'all see the distinction there? Absolutely. Another really good yeah. example is an ectopic pregnancy. Yeah. So if a if a if a, if a fertilized egg implants in the fallopian tube and attaches to the tube, it will start to grow and and uh, multiply cells and everything. But at some point, it's going to grow so big that it will rupture. The woman's fallopian tube that's not the natural place for the baby to have anchored itself. It's supposed to make its way into the uterus and then that doesn't work out. So what's going to happen medically that fallopian tube is now a damaged organ of the body and if, if it's left alone it will get infected and kill the mother. At some point the mother will die. Um, so they can go in and not kill the baby, but remove the damaged fallopian tube. And yeah. when they do that, indirectly, the baby will die. There's no other way. You can't re-implant it somewhere else. We don't, maybe someday we'll have the technology to do that. But at this point, there's no way to take it out of the fallopian tube and put it into the uterus once it has implanted. So you're just removing the damaged fallopian tube, which is a medically necessary procedure to save the mother's life. And indirectly, the baby will die. Yeah, good, good explanation. Um, but it's important to say you're not going in and, um, like with an abortion, right, which just 
directly kills the baby, um, you're you're doing a different thing that indirectly affects them. Oh boy, I'm running out of time. Okay, so on, on this list, murder. Um, somebody said I think we got rape mentioned earlier, lust, um, also things like slavery. Um, Paying an unjust wage or inhuman working conditions is also on there. Torture is on there. Um, the use of contraceptives is on there. Um, and there, there may be more, which uh, the church has talked about. What's that? Abortion. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's on, yeah we put that under murder. Um, but all of them attack the dignity of the human person. It's like, like we mentioned, that's like, that's like the core of Catholic moral teaching, is that being in the image of God in our, in our soul, um, that everybody has an inherent dignity, and we cannot transgress that. Um, so whether it's taking away someone's um, freedom, like with slavery, or not paying somebody what they deserve in justice, or killing somebody who's innocent, right, they all kind of... Um, kind of go back to that same principle. Um, well, that kind of covers my list here. Any final thoughts or questions for tonight? Oh, yeah. It would be nice to, to know that intrinsic evils are not, um, can still be forgiven. It's not yeah. like they're, you know what I mean? Like, Something that like you can't be forgiven for. Yes. Commit evil and intrinsic evil for acts. Good. Always um, And um, I promise we'll get to virtue and vice. <laughs> we'll start with that next week. Um, but a lot of this stuff honestly has has overlapped with that. So, all right. Thank y'all. Appreciate it.